Hi. Hey. How's it doing? <laughs> it's going awesome. Good. Here, you see? Um, can you just please tell me how we say Konstantin? Betigen. Betigen. Thank you very much. But it has been said many different ways before, and I respond to all of them. So, Konstantin Betigen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a professor of planetary science, um, science at Caltech. That's what they tell me, yeah. Yeah, well, I hope so. I surely yeah. hope so. <laughs> and you're fascinated, really, with our solar system and with the formation and, uh, of exoplanets. And you've gathered information this past few years that might prove the presence of a planet nine mm -hmm. in our solar system. We'll get back to this afterwards. First, I'd like to know a bit more about space exploration itself. Right. How does it work? <laughs> You just pop yeah. something there and it's not there the other day, it wasn't there, so you just decide to focus on it. How does it work? Yes, it's a, it's a really, it's a phenomenal question, first of all, and there's a huge, uh, there's a huge, actually, a range of techniques that you use to, uh, to explore space. When it comes to planetary systems, right, things, well, if, you, if you kind of just focus on things outside of our solar system, right, there's two basic things that you can do. Yeah. The first thing you can do is you can count photons. Right? As a right, as a observer on Earth, right, you can just simply look at a star and yeah. say, how much light is coming from there? And I'm gonna measure how much light comes every second. Okay. Occasionally, okay, you will get lucky and notice that periodically the amount of light coming from a star decreases. Why is that? It's because you have discovered a planet which is going in between the line of sight of uh, the observer, namely you, with a telescope yeah. and, and the star. So this is, this is called photometry or the transit method. So that's how you discover, that's kind of the uh, most populous way yeah. through which you have this, you discover extrasolar planets. The other way is actually gravitational. You look at the star itself and you try to detect the motion of the star as it comes towards you and away from you pulled by the planet around. Now, just like an ambulance, which comes towards you and has a higher frequency, right, when, as compared to when it drives away from you, yeah. a star will look periodically bluer or redder yeah. as it's being tugged yeah. by its planet. So those are the two things you can basically do. And it's amazing because it's, kind of it, it's kind of a simple thing. I mean, it, it's technically challenging, but fundamentally it's a simple thing and, and you can find worlds around other stars this way. And what was the first clue that you had for Planet Nine? What was mm. the first thing that you absorbed? Yeah, for the story with Planet Nine began really with the with us noticing that that all of the distant objects in the solar system, these small what we call Kuiper Belt objects, these are just yeah. icy rocks, right, icy debris, <laughs> Uh, were all flying into, so they, held, they had orbits that were all corralled into the same yeah. overall direction. So it looked like somebody uh, had taken these distant objects and carefully arranged them to kind of point in the same In the same way. direction. Yeah. Yeah. That immediately tells you, that's like a gravitational one-way sign that immediately tells you that something is going on. Where is this Kuiper Belt? The Kuiper Belt uh, is really a general term that refers to all of the icy rocks that live beyond Neptune okay. and out to tens of thousands of times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Most of the objects that we know of in the Kuiper Belt are at about 40 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. For comparison, Neptune is at 30. Okay. So they're kind of in the immediate Ooh. neighborhood yes. of Neptune's orbit outside of it. But they stretch out for, as far as we can see, you know, a long, long way. So something was going on in this Kuiper Belt. What happened for you after that? Did, how did you decide to go further? Did you have yeah. to just um, validate a certain point and then you can go further into your research? How does it work? Well, the first question, of course, that we asked ourselves is, okay, we have this pattern in the, in the data. Is it real? Yes. Right? Is, are we just fooling ourselves? Is, is this statistically significant. Pretty quickly, it was evident that this was very statistically significant. Right. We have to go after this. From there, actually, that's where the, the challenge begins of, okay, you have a, a complicated problem. You, the amount of interactions you can play with is only gravity, 
right? So gravity is the only thing going on in the okay. distant solar system. How do you explain it, right? So I tried, I don't know, 12 different ideas. Uh, and really, the way that, you know, you immediately kind of make a list of obvious ones, like, could this have been a passing star that went by and perturbed the solar system when we see that relic information? You do the math, maybe takes a month, and you say, convince yourself, no. Yeah, that can't okay. be it. Yeah, okay. could it be the self-gravity of these objects? Do the math. That actually took a long time to figure out. Uh, the answer is no. You know, so you just go through and you eliminate everything, and at the bottom of that list was the kind of inescapable hypothesis of the planetary album of the solar system is not complete, right? What are the consequences? And then as kind of almost an action of last resort, started playing with Planet Nine, and suddenly all kinds of things about the solar system started to make sense. It was yeah. like, you know, it was like finding a recipe for a jigsaw puzzle. You know, you try many different ones. You say, no, this is the wrong puzzle. No, this is the wrong puzzle. You finally find the right one. It's like everything suddenly falls into place. And that's been really this multi-year journey of realizing what all of those pieces are. They didn't all come together at once. There were certain things that made sense right away, but really it was many years of work that, um, that allowed these kind of moments to accumulate. And what do you need now to validate the fact that there is actually a Planet Nine? Literally the only thing we need is three images, okay? We need, there's a patch of sky, it's about, it's about this big, yeah. okay? Where, where we're searching for Planet Nine. Once we find the right location, what we need is three timestamps of, of Planet Nine. With three, you can see the motion of this object yeah. on the night sky. Fortunately, actually, it so works out that where, where it is, it's about one arc second per night. So arc second is a measure of, of how much you move. Okay. That's perfect for the current software that we okay. have. So, so the motion is detectable. Right? And once you demonstrate that this is an object, which is slowly which is moving, moving. Yeah. you immediately know, you don't actually know its orbit or its mass or anything like that from the images, but you know how far away it is. And if you can see it and it's really far, it's planet nine, that's it, right? I mean, yeah. you need a huge object to be visible. And if you compute and demonstrate that this is really, really far, you're done. It's the discovery and that will be the first expansion of the solar system's planetary catalog in more yeah. than 100 years. Exactly. I was just going to ask, what would be the consequences? Imagine you take that picture. Yeah. What, what, what comes after that? Of course, it's a huge discovery, but... Yeah. A lot of champagne. <laughs> so much champagne. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, look, so the... So there is another planet. I mean, yeah. we could just say that, but mm -hmm. what are the consequences, really? That's a great question. So they're, they're twofold, really. First of all, Okay, Planet Nine, its physical characteristics, right, are unlike anything else in the solar system. Okay. It's it's in this weird mass range where it's between the Earth and Neptune, size-wise. Mm -hmm. We don't know what that looks like, but as it turns out, that's the most common type of exoplanet. The most type the common type of planet around other stars is five Earth masses. Oh, okay. So, Planet Nine, its physical characteristics will be our closest window into understanding what the most common types of planets in the solar system are, period. Right? This is our window into understanding the rest of the galaxy, the, the planetary senses, yes. if you will, of the rest of the galaxy. That's huge. I think that's yeah, huge that from like huge. a you know almost a human point of view of mm -hmm. understanding you know where we come from globally. The other thing is planet nine's orbit is really weird. Right, it's really, it's, it's elongated and it's in the wrong place. And so, understanding, right, con first of all, confirming that it's, it's really there, but then understanding the precise orbital characteristics has constraints about how our own solar system formed. Okay. How did it work? What is the machinery of forming this object and then parking it on a really weird orbit? We will find out remarkable things about the birth environment of our own solar system and ultimately understand how special our own solar system is within the galaxy from this detection. Uh, just one last question. Yes. 
we found out that you were a rock star, of course. You're rocking the stars and you're a rock star. Well, well. So, what's your favorite rock song? What's my favorite rock song? Um, you know, that's a complicated question to, I know. to answer. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what my favorite one to play is that, oh, that sure, we didn't yeah. write. Uh, you know the Roadhouse Blues by The Doors? Yeah. So we do kind of a metal cover of the Roadhouse Blues, and it's so much fun. Because Roadhouse Blues is, was like a metal song before heavy metal was like conceived fully. And whenever we play it live, there's this, uh, there's this remarkable energy in the room that, that transpires. And it's, it's so simple that you can really riff on it and like kind yeah. of introduce. Uh, so so that's, that's one that I enjoy. But, uh, you know, it's hard to put. Of course. You know, <laughs> it's a shoot. tricky question, I must Maybe say. Maybe shine on you crazy diamond. <laughs> All right. Floyd, yeah. yeah. All right. I'll listen yeah. to this one the next time I look at the stars. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.